You're listening to PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link, and I am so glad you're joining us today. My guest is New York Times and USA Today bestselling author James Rollins. And James is going to be here talking to us about uh, two things today, two new books he's got out. He's got an e-book out called Tracker, which is a great story and a great lead into his uh, book that's going to be released, Bloodline. So we're going to pick his brain a little bit about that as well. So a lot of exciting stuff going on for James, which makes it exciting for us as well. So we're going to take a quick commercial break and come right back with James Rollins uh, right after these messages. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Petco, where the pets go. Petco, where the pets go. Pet Life Radio has tail wagging, fur flying, fabulous deals for our listeners from Petco. Get six dollars off your order of sixty dollars or more, and up to forty percent off the entire Petco site. That's right. But that's not all. Because you're a Pet Life Radio listener, you'll also get free shipping on your order of forty nine dollars or more. Six dollars off, up to forty percent off, and free shipping from Pet Life Radio and Petco to get these. These awesome deals go to PetcoDeals.com. That's PetcoDeals.com. Petco, where the pets go. I'm not much of a reader, but I do wish I were more well read. There are so many great books coming out. I wish I could find a way to keep up. Audible.com makes it easy to stay well informed and catch up on your reading simply by listening. Audiobooks from Audible turn downtime into uptime. You'll be more productive and become well-read. Now I'm able to catch up on all the great books I've been wanting to read. With Audible, I feel smarter. Pet Life Radio listeners, try audible.com now and get your first 30 days of Audible Listener Gold Membership plan free. And get a free audiobook. Choose from over 100,000 titles. To get this great deal, go to audibledeals.com. That's audibledeals.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link. And joining me now is James Rollins, talking about his uh, two recent released books. James, welcome to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's always great to see your work come out. And I'm real excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, Tracker, the new ebook that's out, and which is a great lead in for the uh, upcoming novel Bloodline. Uh, so we want to talk to you about both of those. But let's just jump right in to uh, Tracker, which you released as an ebook. Tell us a little bit about that premise and storyline behind that. Well, this story deals with an um, ex army ranger and his military war dog, Kane. And they've been uh, basically on the uh, on the run. He stole his war dog after leaving the service. He's now uh, a bit adrift in the world, and he stumbles upon different uh, in different situations. And in Tracker, he comes upon this woman that's involved with that's being hunted, and he recognizes he's being hunted because of his experience, and he goes to her aid. And we won't give any more than that out about it, but it's really fascinating. And I love the story with you know tying Kane in there and seeing uh, how you know Kane becomes actually the sort of the tracker, also you know keeping an eye out on everything. Well, it's one of the purposes of writing uh, Tracker, and these, these two characters also appear in my novel Bloodline this summer. And I wanted to basically uh, I did a USO tour to Iraq back uh, last winter. And I went to several bases in, in Iraq and in Kuwait and got a chance to actually see military war dogs in action. And that sort of became the genesis of trying to create these two characters. Uh, I was fascinated by the relationship between the, um, the military war dog handler and his, and his dog. And uh, they have a, a phrase called it runs down the lead, uh, describing how over time the emotions of the dog and the, and the, and the uh, handler merge over time. The dog begins to read the handler, the handler begins to read the dog. And I was fascinated by that, and I wanted to try to capture that in both my novel and in the short story tracker, where I, I wrote scenes both from the, uh, the handler's viewpoint, but also from the dog's viewpoint. And that was a great deal of fun, trying to put myself into the, into the paws of that military war dog. 
Absolutely. And I can imagine that, you know, that bond, you know, it's a working relationship. They have to trust each other. But I would imagine the bond, especially in that type of situation, becomes extremely deep. It is. And I, I interviewed several different um, handlers over but prior to writing uh, my novel. And they don't consider their dog so much a dog or even a four-footed soldier. They consider it basically as a partner. That's the phrase I kept hearing. And they weren't calling them their war dog. They weren't calling them their pet. It was their, it was their partner. So it was just really fascinating the way... They describe like, you know, they, they basically eat together, sleep together, they spend all day together, and over time, they, you know, they become in sync with each other. And it truly does, and I think it's a great terminology for it, because it's, it's your partner, you uh, go hand in hand together and experience everything together. And it's interesting the way that's changed over time, actually, that, you know, the history of the war dogs, they'll go back to, to ancient Egypt, back where they were using war dogs in battle. Uh, in the U.S., it goes back to World War One, and they considered war dogs basically to be just uh, equipment. And so, back in World War One, they were actually leaving the dogs and uh, you know behind. They were just like this so they, boy, they might leave um, mm-hmm. hardware behind. They were leaving these dogs behind, and, and the, the backlash from when people heard about this was so severe that they stopped doing that. And over time, that whole philosophy has changed. Uh, you know, for example, the war dogs actually are given a rank. And not many people know that, that war dogs actually have a military rank. And it's always ranked one level higher than their handler. And the reason they do that is that if any handler abuses a dog, they can be court-martialed for striking a superior officer. And so I just found that that, that change in, in role of the war dog over time really fascinating, too. Yeah. And how do you think that just doing through your research and spending time there, you know, we've had a lot of stories and a lot of great books, uh, rightfully so, written uh, about military dogs and war dogs recently. But how do you think that shift has is, is happened? What brought about that type of shift? And, and do you see it going even, even further than where it is today? I think so. Two things. Number one is I, I think that the public sentiment was the drive for changing the attitude in the military. And also it was the handlers that were driving that change also. They did not want to leave those dogs behind. Most handlers actually adopt their, uh, their pet after they leave service. So that relationship even continues beyond military service. And that's the reason why you know, Tucker ends up with his own dog is that's a common thing that happens is the handler will adopt his own dog after, after the length of services is done. But also these dogs are becoming more and more um, sophisticated or technical. They have these vests that they wear that, uh, that are waterproof, that ke- they're Kevlar protected. They're built in with uh, microphones so the dog can uh, radio communicate with their handler. They've got uh, night vision cameras equipped into these, into these vests. So they're becoming a sophisticated piece of military hardware even in that regard. Wow, that's amazing. And I'm sure uh, dating back uh, you know, 10 years even, let alone 20, 30 years, that was definitely not the case. Not at all. But, you know, back in the past, they were, they were basically, I watched a, a video of some footage of dogs during World War I that were uh, military war dogs and had some uh, interviews with the, the handlers back then. And basically back then, they were just like hunting dogs. They were tracking trails. They were um, you know, looking for people hidden in the jungle. And that's totally changed now. Now we have dogs that are, uh, you know, sniffed just to smell out of uh, explosives. They have dogs that are specifically trained for um, hunting. They have, you know, basically they've, they've tailored the dogs towards specific avenues of, of, of action. Exactly. Now, with the um, the launch of uh, Tracker in an ebook form, let me ask you, was it an idea of you want to create a story, a short story, and then you thought, wow, you know, this would actually be a great novel, so let's tie them together? Or is it just a great marketing plan where we thought, okay, we'll give everybody a little taste of what uh, the story is going to be uh, about, and then we'll move right into Bloodline? It's actually, it's more the other way around. I, I wrote the book first, uh, the novel. Oh. And then a new sort of marketing ploy that's going on uh, with a lot of different publishers and authors. Because of the ebook revolution, we weren't able to do this before because the cost of print was such that we couldn't really do short stories that tied into a novel. But with ebooks, uh, you know, I can write a short story, give it to my publisher, and we could have it mounted on Amazon and Barnes and Noble uh, within just a matter of a couple weeks. So that short turnaround allows us a lot more, a lot more flexibility to play with different things. And so it's something that a lot of authors now are doing. Our little um, short stories that uh, tie in or somehow connect to the novel that's coming out. And I so enjoyed writing Tucker and Kane in, uh, in Bloodline that I knew I wanted to sort of give them their own solo adventure. And so doing a short story gave me an opportunity to, to explore them a little in a little bit more depth. 
Yeah, and, and you know, I think that's fascinating. You said that because I guess it, my first thought of it was it sort of went the other way around. You know, you'd write the the little short story to tie it in together, and then introduce the novel, which that's what you're doing. But you're saying you wrote the actual novel first, and then went back and did an, a nice ebook tie-in uh, with it all. Exactly. Yeah. Now, with Tracker, was it a, a piece of the original novel for Bloodline that you were able to sort of subtract out of there, or did you create a whole new sort of a beginning by launching uh, in writing Tracker? It's totally different, unconnected to the, the only thing that's sort of similar between the short story and the novel is just the characters. Tucker and Kane appear in the novel, uh, they sort of stumble upon my main heroes in Zanzibar. Uh, and this story takes place, the short story takes place in Budapest. Um, it's shortly after he's left the service, and it's before he uh, ends up uh, trekking to Zanzibar, where he runs into the, the group of characters from Bloodline. You know, and I think we talk about you know ebooks being a marketing technique. You know, when they're tied into a novel, which I think is a brilliant thing to do. But and of course, you've got your legions of fans that that obviously love your work, rightfully so. But I think the ebook thing is fascinating. The fact that if there are people that are unfamiliar with your books or uh, unfamiliar with the characters, an ebook's a nice, quick way to fall in love with not only the the storyline but the characters as well, which would then. Uh, give them a better taste for when the, the uh, novel actually comes out. Exactly. We're always trying to find new ways of finding that new reader, and these short stories are a great way to do that. Uh, it allows them to sort of sample your writing for uh, not a lot of investment in time or money. So the short stories uh, are a great vehicle for hopefully um, you know, exposing yourself to a new readership. Yeah, and I think that it's fantastic. I mean, I just love the the revolution of it all, and uh, talking about new methods to getting the uh, getting the word out and getting a great story out there. And I think you've done a great job with uh, both of these with Tracker and Bloodline. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're going to take a quick commercial break, but we're going to come back uh, with James Rollins, talk to him a little bit more about Bloodline, and then I'm going to pick his brain about the veterinarian side of him. So everybody, stay tuned. You're listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Sit. Stay. We'll be right back after a short pause. Well, four to be exact. Every pet is unique. Maybe they're gray in the muzzle, yet young at heart. Maybe they're growing out of the puppy stage and into their paws and ears. Or maybe they're just trying to maintain a more girlish figure. At PetSmart... We have the right food for your pet at a great value for you. PetSmart. Be better together. Go to PetSmartDeal.com and save up to 30% on awesome gifts for the pets and pet people in your life. Toys, collars, leashes, PetSmart gift cards, treats, and more. Go to PetSmartDeal.com today. P-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-D-E-A-L.com. Dyson. The new Dyson Animal Vacs are powerful bagless upright vacuums for homes with pets. Air muscle and radio root cyclone technology generates the strongest suction power to powerfully remove dust, dirt, and pet hair from the home or car. To order your Dyson Animal Vac, go to DysonDeals.com. DysonDeals.com to order your Dyson Animal Vac today. Dyson. Music to your ears. Love your pets but wish their medications were a lot less expensive? They are at 1-800-PET-MEDS. You'll not only save on flea and heartworm medications, but on prescriptions for arthritis, incontinence, thyroid, and more. And you get fast service, free shipping, and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. Plus, our licensed pharmacists ensure accuracy, monitor drug interaction, and more. See why over 5 million people have trusted their pet's health to 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. Call now or order online. Go to PetMeds.com forward slash Lucky, L-U-C-K-Y, to get 10% off any order and free shipping on orders of $39 or more at PetMeds.com. Hi, this is Marcy Davis and my service dog, Whistle. (laughs) 
and we're your hosts of Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Working Like Dogs is the show where you can learn everything you ever wanted to know about working animals or working dogs. Whether you're a member of a working dog team or you've just seen a working dog or animal out at the mall or the grocery store and you're curious about how these amazing animals work with their human partners, then Working Like Dogs is the show for you. Join us for the inside scoop at Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. Dot com. <laughs> Welcome back. Welcome back to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. This is your host, Tim Link. I'm here with author extraordinaire James Rollins. We've been talking about his ebook that was launched, Tracker, and his novel, Bloodline. So we're excited about both of those. I know uh, I left a little teaser at the break there about your history as a veterinarian, and I'm right. sure your, your fans know this, but and I'm sure you've been asked this for a thousand times, so I'm going to ask you for a thousand and first time. Tell us a little bit about that and the fact that I think it's really fascinating that you are a uh, – veterinarian you're trained that way and also you're a a a novelist that's launched a a series of fantastic books how did all that come into play and how do you use that as your secret weapon when writing the the novels well i've always wanted to be a veterinarian i I knew i wanted to be a veterinarian since third grade where you got that assignment from teachers that ask you know what you want to be when you grow up i knew even in third grade i wanted to be veterinarian i remember sitting at my desk with a third grade version of myself going you know i want to be veterinarian but i don't know how to spell it (laughs) <laughs> I, did, I did the one thing all third graders hate to do. I actually looked it up, how to sell veterinarian. <laughs> so I was that determined to be a veterinarian from, from way back when. As a matter of fact, in, in the, first, uh, the first introductory uh, day of veterinary school, the dean steps in and finishes his introduction, then goes, everybody take out a sheet of paper. You're having a one-question pop quiz, write down the word veterinarian. Not everybody got that right, but from third grade, I was prepared for that question. <laughs> yeah, if you can't spell it, it's hard to be it, right? Yeah, and veterinary medicine is still always a, a key part. I still, I still do some volunteer work with the local shelter here. I work with a group that traps feral cats, and then I spend one uh, one Sunday, I spend about eight hours spaying and neutering a bunch of feral cats. Uh, I still think you know my biggest claim to fame, more than being a New York Times bestselling writer, is that I can I can neuter a cat in under 30 seconds. <laughs> so my, so my claim to fame. That's a, that sounds like an obscure Western novel in the future. <laughs> I can see the title now. Oh, so, goodness. You know, animals, uh, animals have always been in my books. You know, I've always had different uh, animal sidekicks for my characters, whether it's a, uh, you know, an old German shepherd that I had as a partner in, with one of my characters or an orphan jaguar or cub in another book. Um, I always like sort of peppering my books with different animals. And uh, so when I, I stumbled upon and seen, saw those military war dogs in action, I, I knew I wanted to try to... Uh, Know, bring that unique hero onto the page, but I just didn't want to do a sort of a dry sort of take on that on those characters. I, so a good portion of both Tracker and the novel is from the dog's perspective, and so I want to try to take my background as a veterinarian to try to really capture what it's like to be a dog. I'm not just a you know four legged soldier. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wanted to you know how does a dog experience uh, the, that battlefield, or how does he experience that relationship with his handler. What is it like to view that through the dog's eyes, ears, nose? How do they sense that world? And I, you know, calling on my background about the human-animal bond, calling on my background about uh, how uh, you know dogs perceive the world. I tried to sort of incorporate all that into those scenes from when we're seeing the world through uh, Kane's perspective. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a great way to go about doing it. One of the things I did want to ask you, though, do you also pull upon animals that either have been in your life or, or are in your life? Or animals that you you've helped, uh, whether it be through the spay and neuter program or through your uh, work as a veterinarian. Oh, definitely. Matter of fact, Cain uh, is based upon my my sister's dog. She adopted a, a Belgian uh, Shepherd, which is a common breed used by the military for uh, for military war dogs because of their very uh, very sort of they're like compact German Shepherds. Uh, they're a good size in an environment because you can pick them up and carry them. They can get into areas pretty quickly. And I was so fascinated by this new adoptee of my sister that 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 cooper became kane in my novel that's great now is she going to get a portion of the royalties by saying that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she definitely has a certain portion of dog treats going uh cooper's there you dog. go 10 percent for dog treats off the top i think it works out well <laughs> 
Now, I, I know that uh, in your books, you, know, you talked briefly about the science behind it all as well, and, and you really go deep into some of that, some of the uh, deep technical parts of the, the scientific mind and some of the uh, fantastic things that are going on in the world. Do you care to highlight a little bit about that side of it and why that's important to, to bring into a book? I will always blend in my books a bit of uh, look taking cutting-edge science and sort of seeing where that might go to. And this book, Bloodline, deals with the... Uh, sort of the new cutting-edge technologies involving in life extension and is immortality possible. Sort of the gist for this book came from a uh, Time Magazine article that basically said that in 2045, the year man becomes immortal. And I was wondering, is that possible? You know, within our lifetime, is immortality within our, within our grasp? And so I started doing a bunch of research into what really is going on in that science about life extension. And there's some pretty creepy stuff going on in there. And some pretty exciting stuff, too. And so that's what I sort of delve into in this book is, you know, is it possible to live forever? And if so, you know, would you live forever? Yeah. And would you choose to? I mean, that, that would be, yeah, I think that is the big question that we all think we want to live forever. But do you really want to live forever? That. And, and even if you did, what cost, I mean, what, what would you be willing to pay to live forever? What would, you, you know, what would you be willing to give up or would you be willing to sacrifice to achieve that? Yeah. And that's one of some of the themes I explore in Bloodline. You know, it's much greater than a financial aspect. Obviously, we're talking about you know changing your your lifestyle, changing your body, artificial parts, and all these different things that go into it as well. Right, because there's basically two theories of, of ways we can we can extend our life. One is to to take machines and move them into our bodies, uh, you know, making synthetic organs, using nanotechnology to to basically enhance our physical physicality. Or actually moving us into machines, moving our consciousness into into some type of some type of synthetic arena, and uh, there's some amazing breakthroughs in both of those uh, different uh, extremes of science. And it's actually now breaking into even dealing with uh, genetic manipulation to extend our life. Well, that could be actually good for both of us. You can continue to write novels forever, and I can continue <laughs> to interview. It's a long-standing thing. <laughs> well, you know, it's exciting to think that you know we're. You know, within just a matter of a couple decades of, of, of this significant breakthrough about life extension, and that can significantly alter. I mean, the one of the big breakthroughs in you know of the last uh, you know, half a century probably was the advent of computers, uh, and I think we're going to see the next big change that's going to occur in, in society is this deal with, this deal with life extension, because the world can only hold so many people, and if everybody starts living forever, what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. Wow, great, fascinating stuff. I love that. You know, the great thing about, you know, Bloodline is you're tying all this together. So, I mean, you have, to me, it's you're having a lot of different thoughts provoking in the back of your mind when you introduce all these things. That's my goal. You know, I definitely want my books to entertain. I want them to be roller coaster rides. You know, one of the greatest compliments I get from people are, you know, I was up all night. I couldn't, I couldn't put that book down. But probably what a bigger compliment for me is when someone says, you know, they turned that last page, they closed the cover, and they, they were really left thinking about some aspect of the story. At the end of every one of my books, I sort of have a what's true and what's not in my novel. I sort of lay out where things came from in case you wanted to do further research on any aspect raised in the novel. So you know, one of the greatest compliments is someone will say, you know, I was really interested in this part of the story. I saw your reference at the back. I followed my own uh, investigation into that. It was really fascinating. So then I knew that uh, then I know the novel works more than just at uh, you know, a popcorn entertainment level that is reaching someone at a little deeper level. Yeah, and I think it's a valuable aspect of it. I mean, I really applaud you for that because, you know, as a reader, I know I want to be entertained for those one, two, four, eight hours, whatever I spent, you know, uh, reading through a book. But you take it that step further to really get some thought-provoking uh, things going on in our little noodles to uh, want to take it a step further. And, and I think then it also expands the book, expands the uh, the value of the book, what you get out of it, and as as well as the deep meaning that sticks with you. Exactly. I mean, you definitely want a book to have some resonance, and that, that's my goal is you know entertain, but also hopefully leave them with a little bit something to think about afterwards. Exactly. Now, I know in the book Bloodline, women play a key role, which is, is great for me because <laughs> I have a high female listenership, which is fantastic. But tell us a little bit about that. Why is that important, and, and how did you – you said you got into sort of the mind of a dog on how they would experience a, a, a military dog, soldier dog. Uh, now you're getting in the mind of women, which is could be a landmine. But tell me a little bit about how you went. <laughs> <laughs> well, my wife. I, you know, I, grew, I grew up with three sisters, so they're, they're, they're the first ones that probably my first uh, – uh, line of attack of, in case I'm doing something wrong, they will let me know it. 
But uh, basically, in a lot of action books, the uh, you know for the longest time, the female characters are relegated either to the arm candy for the hero or the damsel in distress that had to be saved. And that's I didn't want these my my female characters. I wanted them to to you know to, to move the story forward to be just as important as the guys when it comes to the action. And uh, again, on that USO tour, I specifically interviewed a lot of the female soldiers out there just to get their experience, what it's like working with men in the field, what it's like being women in the field to try to capture really what it is like, the difference between uh, men and women in battle and conflict in the uh, armed services. But I also have uh, several friends that are um, police women, women in the police field, and I also interviewed them to get their experiences. It's surprisingly how similar the challenges they are, their face uh, being basically women in, in what's considered mostly to be a, a male role. And so I try to capture all of that and try to bring those, that type of character onto the page. Probably will put this uh, incorrectly here, but how how open and honest were they able to be in that situation? Because I know they can be open and honest about their challenges and what they have to go through and what it's really like. But were they really able to uh, open up about what it's like as far as the relationships are concerned and the hierarchy maybe that's concerned when you're talking about uh, females and males? Oh, definitely. They were very upfront. I don't think there was any restrictions. Uh, at least they, they didn't seem to be restricted around me when I was asking those questions. They seemed very open and very and very uh, honest about those relationships. And, uh, you know, I, d- I definitely don't name names or <laughs> things <laughs> like that. But, uh, you know, when we were having lunch over in, in the commissary or, or, you know, just you know, chatting with uh, somebody out in, the, out in one of the, uh, the bases, they were, they were very honest about everything. And was there one glaring aspect that was common with all of them that you would say would be number one on their list of biggest challenges? One of the biggest challenges, I think, is for both female police officers and women in the, in the field is the expectation that they're weaker. And that is something almost every woman says they, they've got to overcome. They've got to, they've got to prove themselves. Uh, a man, let's say two soldiers enter a unit, a male and a female. The male is ex- basically accepted a little bit more readily. The female has to sort of prove herself. There's always that level of having to prove yourself to your male colleagues. And is that proving from a physical or a intellectual, emotional standpoint, or all, all everything combined? I would say it's emotional to prove that they're tough enough, but also physical to prove that they're strong enough. So I think they intellectually they accept them just fine. I think it's more of a of an emotional. Are they going to be a? Are they are they mentally and emotionally tough enough to deal with the extremes of a battlefield? Also, then are they physically strong enough to be able to be a good ally beside them? Wow, that's fascinating. Well, maybe by the year 2045, when uh, man becomes immortal, it'll all be evened out by then. I hope so. <laughs> Let's hope so. Absolutely. Uh, now, James, when uh, when our readers, uh, listeners uh, read the book Tracker and also uh, follow up with Bloodline, what would you hope that they would walk away with? What would be the one takeaway that you would like them to walk away with? Uh, well, a my always overarching goal is to entertain. Uh, I want them to to have a, a you know great thrilling adventure, but then also beyond that, I want them to sort of experience what it really is like to be a military war dog and his handler. What it's what it's like to be that, but also hopefully to explore some of the science aspects of the novel. Good takeaways, yeah, and I think that's uh, like we'd said before. It's uh, a wonderful read, very entertaining. Then you get into all the aspects that get people thinking and doing some research behind it, and uh, educating themselves a little bit more about what all is going on out there. Because fascinating stuff. I mean, literally, in this novel, I sort of explore the fact that you know immortality actually is possible. And if you read this novel, you're going to find some of the pathways towards uh, what's uh, realistic towards uh, potential living. It's not not forever, at least extending our lives significantly. Yeah, absolutely. Well, where can our listeners find out more about Tracker and Bloodline? I know you got a the fabulous book tour coming up here shortly. Where can right. people find out more about you and, and the uh, the books? Probably the best place is, is my website, www.jamesrollins.com. I'm also on Facebook, probably too much on Facebook, uh, <laughs> but I am there. <laughs> Those are great, obviously. Uh, so everybody check that out. Uh, it's www.jamesrollins.com and uh, friend him or, or track him, like him on Facebook. We always love Facebook. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement with you, but you can't get enough Facebook. It's always good to be out there, let people know what's going on. Well, James, I appreciate your time today coming on the show. It's uh, Congratulations on the, the books, the launch of Tracker and Bloodline. Everybody go out and pick up a copy or two of that, and you will be uh, pleasantly entertained and uh, actually get you to start thinking a little bit if you want to step up to that challenge. Uh, thank you for being on uh, Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio today. Thank you very much. All right. Well, we're coming to the end of our show today. 
So I'd like to thank everyone for listening to Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. I uh, also like to thank our sponsors and producers for making the show possible. Uh, to find out more about me, Tim Link, and the other guests I've interviewed on the Animal Rights Show, and uh, read the stories and read more in the blog that I produce, you can go to PetLifeRadio.com. It's PetLifeRadio.com. Click on the Animal Rights icon, and you will have all kinds of wonderful things that will entertain you there. And while you're at it, uh, make sure you check out all the other shows and hosts on Pet Life Radio at PetLifeRadio.com. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for the show or people you'd like to see on the show, please email me. You can email me at Tim at PetLifeRadio.com. It's Tim at PetLifeRadio.com, and I'll be glad to answer your questions and entertain your comments and try to bring on the people you want to see and hear the most on the show. So until next time, write a great story about the animals in your life, share it in a blog, article, or in a book, and who knows, you may be the next guest on Animal Rights on Pet Life Radio. Have a great day. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.